Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start recording and we can go ahead and get started. So uh, the plan for today, um, for some reason this screen, is somebody sharing their screen? I think we can see Peter's screen. Oh, okay. Can you do a stop share, please? Thank you. <laughs> okay. I was like, wait a minute. I, I've lost control here. Okay. Thank it, you. <laughs> I just that's why I don't know why it's calling me valued user, but I'm William Rayburn. So I'm, I'm here. I'm in attendance. Hey, William. Hey, William. Thank you. Um, Good to see your faces. Um, so this is our very last Zoom. We have had, uh, this is our, our fourth and last one. So this is our last time together to um, ask any questions about the SWOT assignment. Um, and then we're gonna go over some um, information on finances. And I am working from home this evening and I also live in a, a flight path. So I'm very sorry if there's some background um, airplane noise. Sorry about that. Um, so if, uh, if anybody wants to jump in, I feel like I've met, I've answered a lot of questions via email. I have met with several of you, uh, your groups online. Um, and so I feel like, at least for right now, it seems like there are um, hopefully no really remaining questions, but I just definitely wanted to make sure that you all were feeling really good about your, uh, the progress in your SWOT assignment and all that kind of stuff. So I'll just open it up to you all. Um, if there are no specific questions, there's a few reminders. I talked about this, um, obviously this assignment in detail the last time we met. But there's a couple things I just wanted to reiterate and reinforce um, so that everybody felt, uh, you know, secure about your, uh, you know, where you were in the process. Um, a couple of things about the difference between the narrative paper and the um, presentation is that because the presentation is a summary of your larger analysis, I do not expect you to uh, have all 13 domains covered in um, your presentation. I just expect you to basically provide in um, you know visual detail the summary that you include uh, at the very end of your paper. So that part um, is important to you know make sure that you know you don't sit, you don't have to sit there and regurgitate every single aspect of your uh, paper in your presentation and your your presentation the content of your slides is only worth I think 10 points on the rubric so if you can think about it that way um, it's very important you know you want it to be you know visually interesting but it really needs to be pretty concise and to the point and just summarizes your overall SWOT uh, your your basically your your big SWAT, your kind of 30,000 foot uh, SWAT, you know, what would the CEO uh, want to know? So not every aspect of every single domain is gonna rise to that, uh, to that level. So. Can I ask you a question about sure. that? Yes, of course. Um, so we maybe don't need as many visuals in the paper, um, but definitely for the presentation, we would want a lot of visuals, but for the paper, maybe more, it's just there's so many words, you know, to add visuals, it seems like in the paper makes it so long. Um, yeah, and so when you say visuals, what do you mean? What do you mean by visuals in the paper? Like graphs and things like that, or images. Um, in the paper, that's absolutely not necessary. In the paper, the okay. only thing that I could see you needing is um, – the uh those tables if you want to put yeah. the tables like in the exemplar um some students if you choose to this is not a required part of the paper so don't like freak out if <laughs> if you haven't done this but some some students choose to include an appendix where they might include a copy of the budget or maybe a copy of the strategic plan or just anything that you think you know might 
help me when I'm reviewing the paper or if it's something is just so long and you don't want to kind of get into the detail in the paper, but it's still relevant. I'm not going to grade that appendix are not required uh, whatsoever, but sometimes people may want to include some other, like maybe a graph, for example, that sh or an organizational chart. Um, that actually might be helpful. Um, but especially because if you add an organizational chart, that's going to be a full page. If you put that in your paper, it's going to, um, you know, it's going to eat up a lot of your real estate. So, but again, I, as I posted on um, in the announcements and or in the revised instructions, you don't have a page limit. Um, ideally, it should it should be under thirty pages, but you don't, you know, you don't really have to worry about going over. But, you know, I also think at some point, kind of enough is enough, and and you know, you don't really have to, uh, you know, try to, you know, I don't expect you to turn in a fifty page paper. Um, does that answer your question about the visuals? It does. Okay. It does. I have one other like little question um, sure. that I just thought of, if you don't mind. Um, it's about the financial and budget mm -hmm. information, that kind of, that portion. Um, I was able to meet with like the CFO of, of our agency and get a lot of good um, information. Fantastic. But I feel like I'm able to, I'm able to mention a strength week weaknesses opportunities and threats without getting really specific about um numbers but i don't know if you're like will you absolutely have to have like this is the percentage you spend on this and this is the you know i don't know what your expectations are for that portion uh, that's a really really great question um i think i didn't answer that um my expectation is that when you uh, analyze and categorize certain attributes of the organization as strengths or weaknesses, um, that that is supported by evidence. And so, as I kind of said before, you know, you can't analyze what you don't know. Um, so if it's not in your paper, I'm going to make the assumption that you don't know it. Um, so. That being said, I would be careful about what you choose to include and what you choose to not include. That being said, I don't want you to get super granular, especially with regard to the budget. I don't necessarily need to know what the CEO's salary is compared to the frontline staff salary, unless that's a very significant issue, actually, as I have seen in some agencies that causes massive issues with organizational culture when they, you know, the CEO makes double what they do or something like that. So unless it's, it's a significant kind of salient point, I don't think that you have to provide excessive detail, but you need to be detailed and explicit enough um, that I can see why you're making those leaps that I can see, Oh, this is why they're saying this is a strength or, Oh, this is why they're saying this is a weakness. Um, which is why that analysis portion is so uh, important in your paper is that you have to do more than just describe. Like you could describe the budget all day long, but that doesn't really tell me anything. I want to know what you think about it. I want to know how you see this as a, um, as a, or a weakness for the organization. Um, so you kind of have to strike this, an organic balance um, with how much you share and how much uh, you decide to leave out. Um, that probably sounds vague. I can imagine that may sound a little bit vague, but the reason why I don't um, dictate that you include a budget or that you have to include this, that, and the other is because every organization is different. Um, and so it just, there's no way that I can account for all those differences. And so I'm just trying to kind of give you a framework to work from, and I expect you to, to fill in the blanks, essentially. Does that answer your question? Or is it clear as mud? <laughs> I can try to answer it another way if you don't, if you, if you feel like you need more information. Okay. So yes or no? Thanks. You got it. Okay. Um, so, and if at any point, yeah. um, oh, it sorry. Does. I, my internet, I think my internet connection got a little, it was hard to hear that last bit. Oh. Okay. Well, um, did that answer your question or, okay, sort of kind of, okay. If you have um, follow-up questions after tonight, 
please email me with um, the word SWAT question in the subject line and I will know that it's time sensitive and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, so if there's something that I don't answer here or that I wasn't clear enough or anything like that, please email me um, individually and I will uh, get back to you as soon as possible. Um, Terry, you had a question about, um, you know, what if you can't get access to the budget? Um, but you were given basic information on the budget. Um, as I said, you know, you can only analyze what you know. So I just expect you to move forward with the basic information that you were given. Um, cause that's just kind of typical. And I have, um, put some caveats in the instructions. If you haven't read the revised instructions, um, for this assignment, please make sure that you do that because I covered that point. Um, in that about, you know, how do you handle when you sort of have a hole in your, um, in your, uh, analysis because, um, you asked for information, but they weren't willing to share it, um, or for, for whatever reason they couldn't share it. So, um, there's some instructions in there about how to handle that, which is essentially to make sure that I know, communicate to me that I know that you asked for it, you did your due diligence, you tried to get it. But you, at the end of the day, you know, you have no control over what people, information people give you. So um, you can just say that in your paper. You can just say that, you know, we asked for it and all that kind of stuff. Um, or the authors, you know, you, you wouldn't write in first person. You need to write in third person. Um, does that answer your question, Terry? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, any other questions along those lines about access to information or how to handle the budgets? We're definitely going to talk more about the budgets tonight, um, at least for uh, a few minutes, because I want to make sure that, um, you know, everything that I'm going to talk about is, is outlined very clearly in the, the slides for the last two lectures or the last two units. Um, but uh, I want to make sure that I go over a little bit of it and see if you have uh, have any questions around that. Okay. Um, so I made the point about, uh, reiterated the point about um, the, uh, you know, you don't have to include all 13 domains. Um, you know, make sure you allow your group time to practice, especially if you're um, preparing live or even if you're recording, um, you know, you, you have a 20 minute maximum. So make sure that those transitions are really tight um, because, you know, group cohesion and, and things like that are also part of your grade. Um, and because the, the skill set that it takes to orally present something is very different than the skill set that it takes to, to write something in narrative format. Um, so that's why we're looking at this at two, you know, this, this assignment has two parts. Um, uh, lastly, the group evaluation statement is absolutely critical to um, your final grade on this assignment. Um, those are due the day that you um, present or I guess technically they're not due until April 24th when I, um, you know, said that the papers are due, but, but just as a matter of practice, whenever your presentation is done, I would recommend submitting those. Um, even if you're going to spend a few days, you know, writing your paper, just do not forget to turn in those group evaluation statements because even though they're not given specific points, um, I cannot grade your group. I can't give you a group grade or individual grades before I read your group evaluation statements. And um, so, and sometimes people um, get excited that the, <laughs> that the work is done and they forget that last piece. And so um, you will lose points for, um, a, according to the, um, the late policy assignment and the syllabus, if you don't turn that in, um, on time, but as I said, technically I won't deduct points until after, after April 24th, but um, the sooner you get those in, the sooner I can grade uh, your final paper. Um, okay, I think those are all the you know, reminders I had about the SWAT assignment. Um, oh, one more thing. I've received a lot of questions around um, you know, when there's something that you're looking at in the SWAT and you feel like there's overlap um, and that it might kind of go in more under more than one section. And um, that in some cases is, is expected and you're welcome to kind of put it where you think it works best. Um, and just remember that that context is important. So, um, you know, if you feel something needs to go in two different sections, then kind of, you know, when you're in the individual sections, 
explain, you know, make sure that you're kind of tweaking it so that it fits for that section. You're kind of explaining that. Um, but it makes perfect sense that there's a lot of overlap things. Um, things even might, might be strengths and weaknesses, the exact same issue. <laughs> um, um, so, or something could be both an opportunity and a threat depending on other conditions. So, um, you know, as long as you're explicit and you provide examples and evidence, then all of that should flow uh, pretty naturally. It's uh, kind of yet another reason why I try not to kind of dictate everything that you do um, within this assignment. I just want to give you an overarching framework um, because, it's, again, it's just very unique depending on your agency. Oh, um, one last piece about the, the summary SWOT that you will include in the presentation. Um, there is not a specific number of items that you should have under each one that's going to be completely uh, um, specific to your agency and your analysis. Um, so you might find that you have, you know, one threat or two threats that are so significant that, you know, if you don't deal with them in the next six to 12 months, that it could be really bad for your organization. Um, so maybe you only have a few under that, but maybe they have so many strengths or there's so many opportunities because of whatever is going on in that community or with that population that you have six. <laughs> so you don't have to feel like you have to arbitrarily, you know, have four, you know, bullet points under each one of those in your, in your summary. It really is truly, you know, what are the most significant strengths? What are the biggest opportunities? What are the, the worst weaknesses? What are the most significant threats, you know, that are out there? Um, so it's, it's truly um, is dependent on your analysis. Okay. Are there, uh, are there any other questions about the SWOT assignment? Okay, uh, can you please uh, put your, your screen on mute? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get, uh, we'll get started on a discussion of um, agency finances and organizational stability. Um, obviously, I will not go through um, all of these slides. Hopefully, you all have uh, looked at these already. Um, but today, I just want to talk about um, some basics. And, um, you know, you all, you know, asking for the budget is critical. And as in Terry's example, you know, sometimes they can only share you, you know, share with you a, a little bit of the budget or, you know, aspects of it. So it's going to be a lot harder for you to, um, to analyze, but whatever you, whatever information you do get um, should be filtered through the, through this lens, which is um, as it's outlined in the, in the Brody chapter. So um, your, an agency's budget really goes hand in hand with an agency's strategic plan. Um, it really, it, the budget in its own way is a plan. Um, it's time sensitive, it's specific, um, it has lots of, um, you know, detail around um, allocation of resources, of course, um, people's salaries, um, training line items, there's all kinds of um, information in a budget, which is why part of this, such a big part, portion of this assignment is asking you to look at that. Um, so it really is kind of this way for you all to make sure that um, you know, quote unquote, you know, you put your money where your mouth is that you are, um, you know, walking the talk because you could have this, you know, glorious, wonderful agency mission, but if you, and a fantastic logic model and a strategic plan and all this, you know, great stuff out there that makes sense, but if your budget doesn't support that, then what are you doing? Um, because your how you spend your money for the most part is really what drives your agency. Uh, you may have other things like volunteers or thing or in-kind donations or things that don't necessarily cost money, but they're part and parcel all under this kind of financial umbrella. Um, so understanding the budget at it, you know, at its core helps you understand the organization, helps you understand where the organization's priorities are, just like your own budget in your household or your personal budget. Um, you know, it tells you that you will prioritize, you know, eating out 
over um, cooking at home <laughs> or, you know, any other, you know, myriad examples that, that you could think about for yourself. Um, an agency's budget is truly no different. It's just probably, you know, more and is kind of a little more complicated and involves more things. But at its core structure, it's really not any different than a budget that you would develop um, for yourself. It's just, like I said, a little more complicated. Um, and, you know, one of the things I also want to remind people is, you know, it's really important to, you know, follow the money, watch the money, make sure that if you're in charge of money, that you dot all those I's and cross all those T's because it doesn't matter how wonderful you are. If, you know, if the money is funny, you know, you could be fired. You could also be responsible for um, the agency losing funding. Um, if they, especially if they receive public funds and something doesn't come up right in an audit or you're not doing something like entering your time correctly, which I'm sure everybody, if they have a job or an internship, you're responsible for that kind of, you know, weekly or monthly, um, you know, time sheet. A lot of that, a lot of times your time is, um, tied to a, um, a certain funding stream. And so if it's not entered correctly, it could cause problems, maybe not that week, but it might cause problems down the road. Um, so things like that are, are also kind of part of this. So even if you don't actually handle finances or you're not in, in charge of a contract, you know, everything that you do at an agency um, somehow, some way relates to the budget. Um, the very least of which is, you know, your salary. Um, so I'm not going to go over all these, but uh, there are a number of different budget formats. The text does a really good job of kind of outlining these. Um, the line item budget is, uh, especially if you see a state contract budget, this is definitely going to be a line item budget. Um, your household budget is a line item budget, you know, food, entertainment, uh, you know, rent, insurance, car payment, you know, all of those different uh, you know, different line items, just different items that you can kind of categorize and then assign a, um, you know, an amount to, um, you know, gas, clothing, food, all of that's going to be typically um, in a line item budget. It's going to be the most common uh, one for agencies that you all are analyzing. Uh, we'll probably use uh, some kind of a line item budget. Um, there are other ways to, um, to think about budgeting. Sometimes there's um, kind of performance or outcome budgeting, which actually a lot of um, state contracts are moving to, especially in social services. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, third-party reimbursement payments that can uh, are starting to get tied to outcomes. So that will be something, especially if you're going to uh, be on Medicaid, that your state may be focused on. Certainly here in Tennessee, uh, uh, Ten Care is very focused on um, on outcome budgeting. Um, kind of all the way down and it started in, in um, physical health and has moved to behavioral health. So that's something that's kind of coming down the pike for, for you all uh, to pay attention to. And that's essentially looking at, um, you know, how well you're doing your job. So it's not just you're going to do a job and get paid. It's they're looking at that quality piece. They're looking at um, other things and then also, you know, integrate things like incentive payments and stuff like that into that. So um, but for your purposes, most of what you're going to see is a line item budget. Um, there's other budget categories that you may see um, as you're looking at your uh, budgets that you receive from your agencies. Um, capital budgeting is really, really important for um, agencies, especially um, any agency that might um, own a building that they're working out of, or maybe they even are in a building that was donated to them, uh, but they've been in it for 15 years and there's a really bad roof leak that they have to focus on, or there's some, you know, they'd like to expand or something like that. Um, you know, all of those kind of large uh, amounts, uh, generally exceeding about $5,000 is usually the line for that. Um, you would have to make sure that you're kind of looking at an agency to, to figure out uh, I mean, looking at as an agency to to make sure that you're budgeting correctly for because you might need to spend twenty thousand dollars on a new van if you are part of Meals on Wheels or um, some other agency that needs to maybe you provide transportation for people going to the doctor, um, but you're not going to need to buy a van a new van every year. Um, so there are ways to to look at things like that. Um, 
you know, cash flow. This is something that's important. Um, I don't know if you'll get into this level of detail with your agencies. If you do, um, that's fantastic. Um, but this is a really big deal and a lot of um, agencies will have to close because they have a um, essentially a negative cash flow. So there's too much money that they um, owe versus the cash on hand. Um, positive cash flow is you know just the opposite of that so they have more cash available than is needed um, an example of this how this uh, may impact you is uh, for example if your agency has a lot of state contracts if the state government does not the you know general assembly or legislature within the um, the state does not pass a budget they may not pay, and, and actually if they don't pass the budget, they probably won't um, pay their contractors. And this has happened. This is actually happening in a state um, a little north of Tennessee right now um, where the state you know, hasn't passed a budget um, for some time. And so there's um, you know, vendors like behavioral health providers, social service providers, um, criminal justice uh, providers, um, there are whole agencies that employ uh, LCSWs or employ counselors, and um, the agency may only be able to cover those costs of um, of social work, <laughs> the price of social work, uh, you know, for a certain amount of time, um, only for so long. You only have so much money in reserves, um, and that's actually, as I said, you know, kind of happening right now. So understanding um, things like what the funding stream, what the funding source of your own um, salary is, is always something that I recommend that you all ask about when you start a new job. That's just a little an aside, <laughs> um, but I definitely recommend it. You may, be, you may not realize that you're in a grant funded position. Hopefully they will tell you at the beginning uh, of your tenure with the organization, but sometimes they, they may not. Um, so basically if you do, if your agency does not have the cash on hand to pay salaries because someone else is not paying them, then you know all of that kind of uh, trickles down and kind of rolls downhill. And, um, and that's kind of one example of how something as macro as did the state pass a budget or was there a budget cut um, in our program can translate into um, the lives of individual social workers and also can affect, of course, the clients that we serve. So, um, that's enough about that. Um, so there are some other terms that will be uh, relevant for you all to know. Um, again, I'm not going to go over all of these because they're outlined in your book, but um, some terms to, or at least kind of concepts for you to understand are this idea of, um, you know, unrestricted funds versus restricted funds. And unrestricted funds, typically um, uh, nonprofit um, social service agencies, they love unrestricted funds because they get to use it on anything they want. <laughs> um, but other funds like contract or grant funding, donor restricted funds, um, those are, they're restricted. They, they kind of have quote unquote strings attached. Um, so they are um, limited in how they can use those funds. Um, can anybody think of uh, any examples of, um, of um, the use of restricted funds. Can anybody think of any examples? Have you ever come across, any of you ever come across, um, um, like maybe you worked for a grant or something that you know would be considered a, a restri restricted funding? Yeah, in my clinic, we get sometimes some funding through pharmaceuticals uh -huh. from, um, for instance, tetrabenazine, which is a drug that's used for Huntington's disease. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very selective on how um, the funding that they give us, you know, it's a very expensive medicine. So we are supposed to use any type of funding mm -hmm. that's been given to us through um, you know, for indigent patients, or it's 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 patient based and need based. Um, it sounds like, yeah. So that's kind of a very 
strict example of what you just asked. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That's, that's a, that's a perfect example. Um, and because the pharmaceutical company is, um, donating it and it serves as a tax write-off for the for-profit pharmaceutical company, um, they get to essentially tell, um, the clinic or, um, the service provider, you know, how they want those funds, uh, to be used. And under the, um, uh, procurement section of this lecture, um, there's some some more uh, kind of details about that. So that, that's an absolutely perfect example. Um, any other examples that you all can think of? I worked under the VOCA grant, yeah. the Victims yeah. of Crime Act, yeah. and so that money had to pay for positions that were serving victims of crime. Absolutely. Another great example, and that's that example is one that um, is very, very common for um, nonprofits and, and social service agencies. Is you know you get a, a grant contract, <laughs> you know you get um, you know some kind of public funding. It's taxpayer dollars, and you or sometimes you might even have to apply for it. You might have a discretionary grant which says you know you apply for it, and if you're you know you're the best program, you know you'll get funded from by the federal government. Or, or the state government. Um, um, but it's it, a lot of times that's limited and or is for a specific program. So maybe you have a funding stream that only serves, um, you know, 12 to 17 year olds or only serves uh, fourth graders or, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, dependent or, or limited to a certain um, demographic or a certain, I've, in my um, background with mental health, Every grant uh, that, I, not everyone, but most of the ones that I worked on were um, limited to uh, serving children who actually had a diagnosable mental health disorder. So not just a mental health need. Um, it wasn't like they were experiencing trauma and we could serve them. They had to have full on, um, uh, you know, DSM-4, DSM-5 uh, diagnoses. Um, so that became like a whole other um, you know, thing that we were tracking and having to report on and look at and, you know, what were the, you know, what were the, the mental health disorders that we were, um, of the kids, you know, we were serving. So, and we were totally limited. Our hands were tied, you know, quote unquote tied um, to only serving, um, you know, if you had kind of essentially an extreme need or, you know, a serious emotional disturbance. So that's a pretty common example. Um, Okay, um, so moving on, um, sometimes in your budget you may get, uh, you may see that there's income from a service or business activity, such as um, a fee that you would charge for services rendered. Um, for those of you who are interested in going uh, and becoming an LCSW, you know, this is essentially where probably the, the vast majority of your income will, will come from, especially if you're going to be in private practices, you know, that's your, kind of your basic you know, 50 minute therapeutic hour and our clinical hour. And, um, you know, that's, you know, you have a fee for that, you charge that, um, you render the service and then your clients pay you. Um, and that's where your income comes from. So there may be, a, a, um, you know, so this would be something when you're looking at uh, an analyzing for your SWAT is, are there different services that charge different fees? Uh, within your your agency, and so maybe that there's some um, conversation uh, or some other um, a deep dive that you want to have with that. Um, are there any questions about that before I move on? I can't if you if you're on the chat. I can't always see that when I'm sharing my screen like this. So, um, okay, some other um, income and expense terms. Endowment income, that's funds established by donors in a specific name. So if you've been to a hospital or a university um, and you see, you know, like the Sarah Cannon, you know, cancer center or something like that, that's someone who has, you know, given a lot of money to support, a, you know, a specific thing. Um, you know, pledged income, those are pledged drives. So you might not actually have that income yet. That's sort of anybody who listens to NPR is probably very familiar with their, you know, fall and spring pledge drives that they have. Usually those are time limited as well. Um, cash or in-kind matching funds. I want to pause on this for a minute because this is really, really important to many nonprofits. It kind of depends on what your, uh, kind of what services that that agency provides. But this is um, 
as it says, you know, goods, facilities, services, or equipment that are matched to a specific income source. So a lot of times if you have a federal grant, it might require that you have, that you match the, the, the grant funds that you're getting. All of the grants that I worked on um, had a very, very, very steep um, match. So if it was a million dollar grant, then we had to have a million dollars in match. We had, we had to match it with either cash or in kind. Um, but those in kind, but for just, you know, regular um, kind of run of the mill um, nonprofit in kind um, matching funds or in not even just matching funds, but just in kind goods um, can kind of make or break the organization. Um, when people donate things to an agency, it helps their clients. It means that an agency doesn't have to pay for that good or service or facility or use of a facility. Um, and so nonprofits are able to do many, many, many things because of this um, ability to accept um, in-kind donations. Um, and those things truly do add up to money. Um, you know, it make, you know, if you wanted to have a banquet in a banquet hall, it may cost you $1,500 to just rent the space for an evening, you know, depending on what it is, or $500 just to rent the space for an evening. But because you're a nonprofit, the proprietor of that banquet hall may say, oh, I agree with your mission. I'm going to allow you to use this facility and I will not charge you the $1,500 that we normally charge. That's the same thing as if that facility wrote the agency a $1,500 check and they had a line item under their revenue of $1,500. It's basically the same thing. Um, so it's one of those ideas that you all are probably really familiar with. You may just have not you know, understood that as the term or understood the significance of how, um, how much nonprofits often operate from this sort of pool of in-kind um, goods and services that kind of comes in and goes out. Um, can anybody think of any examples that you have experienced with your internships or your, your, job, your jobs where you've been involved with um, in-kind services or goods or donations? Um, if any of you all have ever worked um, with a school, you know, a lot of schools have backpack drives um, where they may um, have backpacks donated um, by some, you know, Walmart or something like that. And then maybe the, their local grocery store will provide food um, for the backpacks. Um, and then maybe another um, uh, a company provides um, school supplies or maybe Walmart also provides the school supplies and then they have volunteers come in and actually assemble all the backpacks for the school for the kids to you know take home for the weekend or take home for the summer um, all of that is is essentially donation and in kind you know somebody donated all of that and somebody also administratively is tracking the value of all of those donations um, and so they're the same in many ways as um, money because again it would cost just like the um, just like the the banquet hall it would cost money to buy those backpacks and they would not you know be able to serve those kids in that way if they didn't come in the form of donations um, so that's just something to really look out for and um, and analyze when you're looking at your um, agency budget um, so just because you might not see a line item for you know backpacks or something like that um, doesn't mean that they're not providing some kind of um, uh, you know, service or is being supported in that way. Um, you have a question? Okay. Um, so moving on, um, some other terms, accounts receivable, cash accounting, accrual accounting. These are, um, you know, different terms or, you know, that are used for, um, um, you know, how you essentially track um, the funds that are coming in and going out. Um, and uh, so this, you know, you may not get this, uh, this detailed or granular, but um, it is an important for you to understand, especially, of course, if you're overseeing budgets, um, especially things like um, 
you know, accounts receivable is just simply like revenues that are earned, but not yet received. So essentially you've billed something, um, but you haven't yet gotten the money. And I always <laughs> tell students like, how many, how many of you have, have not paid a Comcast bill or have not paid a, you know, electric bill or have clients who can't afford their electric bills? If you think about how much that, um, you may do that for one month, but you may have entire populations of people or, or whole segments of a city, um, in different zip codes that are just simply can't afford to pay their pay their bills and for the agency or the you know service provider that is a really big deal to have provided all these services but then and so you build people but then they haven't um, you know they don't have the funds coming in so it's one of those things also to think about it can be a lot of high risk um, okay um, okay so keep uh, keep moving on um, so these are just some other expenses or other uh, terms to be familiar with you know fixed revenues those are based on a constant income flow or quote-unquote hard money um, fixed expenses are um, calculated using recurring expenditures and you know those are those things that you know you're always gonna have to pay for like um, you know, salaries, or even though those may change a little bit, um, but things like rent on your office space, um, those things you know are typically not gonna change, uh, are, are considered fixed. Variable expenses are just the opposite of that, so they may fluctuate depending on the increases or decreases in the services that are needed. Um, so depending on, you know, if you're, say if your service numbers, you know, increase or decrease from month to month, this is gonna be something that, you know, the, the funding for that is gonna change. Um, Indirect costs uh, or sometimes administrative costs, those are really important to um, understand as part of the overall um, agency budget. Um, and also this is a really, uh, from all my time in government, this is a place where a lot of, I'll just be honest with you, just a lot of fraud occurs um, or a little kind of gray area or like I said, you know, we're not gonna, um, you know, people who um, might not, be as ethical as they should be in filling out their timesheets and things like that. Um, but this is something to, to, to pay attention to, to just kind of note. Um, it's really important from an accounting standpoint that when you have a, um, you know, multiple funding streams that are paying for um, different aspects of a person's salary. So the CEO, for example, may, you know, that's a, that's a, just a pure cost. You know, the CEO is not necessarily um, bringing any in any revenue. They might bring in relationships, but you know, people aren't necessarily, except for donors, you know, aren't really writing the, the CEO checks. Um, just like, you know, which is different than if you're actually providing a billable service, then you're actually producing revenue that might cover your salary. Um, but something like uh, an administrative assistant or a receptionist that answers the phones um, for your 1-800 number, um, you know, that's, that's just pure cost for the agency. And so a lot of times those costs get shared um, across, um, you know, two or more programs or two or more funding streams. And so it, they, there's some very specific ways that you need to make sure that you're accounting for those things. And so I just wanted to highlight for you that that's also a place where things can get a little squirrely. Um, so it's one of those things I always just kind of have my eye on whenever I'm looking at budgets. Um, so they're, like I said, they're also known as kind of shared costs or overhead costs or administrative costs um, because they're just, they're kind of purely administrative. They're not necessarily bringing in um, revenue to support the program. Um, and a lot of times the percentage of the overall cost of a program will vary um, greatly. And um, this is something to look at when you are um, looking at the overall budget. Um, so can anybody think of an ideal kind of percentage that you would want to, like if you were gonna give your money to a nonprofit, you know, at what point would you say, you know what, they're spending too much money on just running the program and not enough money on actual, actual direct services. Um, you know, would that be 5% or 10% or 40%? Um, do you, have you all, have, do you all have any thoughts about that? Just even with your own um, money or any of the, um, any, you know, places you may have worked 
do you know how much their administrative costs were or what you would kind of consider an ideal It may not be something that you've kind of spent a lot of time thinking about, but um, it is something that's important and that actually when you start thinking about like strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats, um, you know, having low, being able to kind of quote unquote, keep your overhead low. So keep your administrative costs down um, or I mean, typically, you know, you would want to see those kind of hover around the 10% the range. Um, they certainly can be, you know, higher or lower that. Um, our state contracts that I used to work on, they were typically at like 20%. They were truly 20%. It cost 20% of the overall program to just simply run the program. Um, so when you think about your own you know, dollars or, you know, how you would want to see public funds or taxpayer dollars used. This may be something that you, um, you know, kind of want to keep an eye on. And there's actually whole, you know, indices that track this for, um, for social service um, uh, groups that I've seen. So they, they will actually kind of rank, you know, different nonprofits that say, you know, this, you know, nonprofit X has a 12%, you know, administrative costs or, um, you know, this one has 15 or this one has eight. Um, some nonprofits will, um, will promote their agency when they're doing fundraising campaigns and tell you right up front that 100% of your donation is used for direct service. I'm sure that, sure that you all have seen that, uh, that one before too. Um, so that's just something that uh, can kind of maybe considered a strength or a weakness. Um, so some other income and expense terms, I'll kind of, um, going to move through these. Um, okay, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, just kind of overall um, understanding of just, I, I kind of touched on this in the beginning, um, but really just how critical the budget is for the running of an organization and for your under, and for you, you all who are completing your SWATs and also moving forward in your career. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is for you to just be aware of your agency's budget. You know, don't assume that just because you got paid this month that you're going to get paid next month. I mean, of course, you know, we all kind of put that as an aside and, and don't really hopefully try not to lose a lot of sleep over that. But if you don't have an, but what I'm saying is when you're entering a new job or the workforce, just understanding how agencies are funded, which you all is part of your assignment. Um, it's not something that's just for this assignment. Um, I'm really hopeful that you will take at least a, a baseline understanding of this material as it relates to finances moving forward, because it really can mean the difference between, um, you know, you having a job today and not having a job um, tomorrow. And that may sound extreme, but it's actually true and as someone who's been responsible for making budgetary decisions at the state level um it's not a game <laughs> it's something that people take very seriously but ultimately sometimes you're you're forced into a no-win situation and you do have to cut somebody's budget or you have to decide between you know cutting this budget five percent and this budget 25 percent which might mean somebody's salary um so understanding as i said before you know where your um, you know, where your specific salary comes from, how, you know, the funding streams for the clients that you serve, um, those are all really important. Um, so having a basic understanding of that um, is also critical for agency administrators, for funders, um, for, and for kind of boards of directors and, and public officials. Um, it's, you know, it's sort of the budget in a way for those kind of stakeholder serves as a contract. Like I said at the beginning, a budget is really a plan. Um, so once the board of directors agrees to a budget, you know, that doesn't mean the CEO can just kind of go rogue and start spending money in some way that's not um, allowed for in the budget without going back to the board. Um, it truly is a bit of a, a, a contract and agreement, sort of like your syllabus and this is an agreement between, um, you know, the instructor and um, you as the student. Um, managers and executives are obligated to keep the budget in balance. Um, when you're looking at budgets, you want to be optimistic, but also realistic when you have to develop those. Um, so if you think that there's potential for funding cuts, make sure that you have a plan B or a plan C. Um, 
definitely don't want to spend what you don't have and you don't want to expect to get bailed out of a situation if you overspend. Um, just like many of you um, might not have any kind of safety net or your clients might not have any kind of safety net um, if they kind of overspend for the month, um, they may have to, you know, not eat for a little while or make some decisions about buying food or paying the electric bill. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's a reality for millions of people. And um, it's also a reality for our, our agencies too. Um, they can't expect to just get bailed out um, uh, if they overspend. So keeping all that uh, in balance is really important. Um, so the budget, as I said, kind of before, it's tied to organizational priorities, objectives, and it supports the mission. Um, so again, this is like, it's a really great and can be even a fun exercise to sort of look at the budget and then look at the strategic plan and see if you can actually see where the budget supports the initiatives that are outlined in the strategic plan. And if you can't see those things, you know, maybe that's a follow-up question for your contact at the agency, um, or maybe it's just really not there. Um, budgets can be kind of, you know, kept secret or be developed from the, from the bottom up, depending on the culture of the organization. Um, you know, some, you know, some budgets are developed just purely by the board of directors or, you know, kind of the C-suite, which is the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, the chief, oper chief operations officer, you know, kind of the, that top tier leadership and nobody else sees the budget. Um, and then sometimes the budgets are developed, you know, from a more, um, kind of programmatic standpoint, or you might have supervisors or even clients that have input um, into, you know, kind of what services or, you know, what things they might like to see, you know, in their program. So that, that is going to be, um, you know, totally, you know, it's going to vary greatly um, across organizations. Um, you might see budgets that are organization wide or, um, or, or and or tied to specific programmatic units. Usually if it's a large organization, it's definitely gonna have um, individual program budgets or at least certain, you know, divided up kind of somehow. Um, if, you are, if you are analyzing as part of your SWOT a, um, a piece of an agency, so maybe just one unit or one arm, um, of a, a larger agency, make sure that you pay attention to this piece because you don't want to get the larger, you know, agency-wide budget and then start applying it to your program because it may not actually work um, that way. Also, you want to make sure that you have a good understanding of, you know, how big is that programmatic unit within uh, relation to the larger um, agency. So, you know, if you're, just one example is, um, if you're looking at like a homeless outreach program and, um, the, you know, that's one of their primary objectives in their strategic plan, it's part of their mission. Um, but then you see that only 20% of their overall budget is for their homeless outreach program. You know, that might raise some red flags for you and, or at least have you ask some follow up questions as to, well, if this is kind of the main deal, what y'all are supposed to be doing, then, you know, where is all this other money going? Um, so things like that will be important to look at. Um, budgets can also be used as a, as a management tool to monitor staff performance and program outcomes. Um, so anybody who's ever worked in case management is probably very familiar with things like quotas and uh, making sure that you, um, you know, have specific um, units of service that you meet, um, you know, benchmarks that you're responsible for meeting um, every week um, or every month. Things like that all get always get rolled up into a report and somebody is on the hook <laughs> for that, whether you've met them or whether you haven't. And especially if you're a supervisor who's responsible for multiple people, um, you know, that's something that they're going to be monitoring very, very closely because they have to, they have to report on it. Um, you know, they have to report back to the, you know, if they're meeting those goals or not meeting those goals. Um, obviously budgets should be monitored regularly to avoid problems. Um, this is one of those things I've unfortunately seen too many times where people were, agencies were not paying attention to the budget and then they, they didn't spend down all their funds. And so then they didn't get those funds again the next year. So, um, it's not something that you need to be looking at only once in a while. Um, budgets can be revised during the year to account for changes in revenue or expenses. 
Um, typically, you'll need to go back through whatever that internal approval, you know, budget approval process is. Um, approving the budget, what that process is, may be something for you all to look at um, as part of this section in your, your SWOT as well. Um, and definitely, especially in the nonprofit sector, um, you want your budgets always to, to consider cost cutting strategies and definitely focus on long range financial stability, such as things like establishing working capital, ensure cost effectiveness, and definitely um, seeking diversified funding. Um, the diversification of the funding streams in for your agency is absolutely something that you're going to want to look at um, when you are um, completing your SWOT. And can anybody tell me why diversified funding um, is such a big deal within the nonprofit sector? Why? Do you all have any ideas about that? Well, one aspect would be is if one funding stream, stream does dry up, then you have other um, funding streams that you can pull from um, to get you through until that one can be um, 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 resourced again. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of like having all your eggs in one basket. Um, for those of you who all live in Nashville, um, I'm still so um, – <laughs> Not happy with uh, what happened to one of our local nonprofits here several years ago. We had one emergency shelter for um, youth who were homeless in the city, pretty much. There was just only one. Um, so not adults, so basically kids who were homeless. And um, they had an issue with the federal grant that funded um, that shelter, which was a phenomenal shelter and part of a, a, a much larger. Um, um, kind of support network and support um, agency for um, kids with high needs like that. And it closed. The entire shelter was shut down and is basically still shut down because it was at least that, that iteration of, of what that shelter looked like. And um, it be, all because it was basically funded by one, you know, major kind of federal grant and they, um, kind of, I guess, assumed that they were going to get it. And then there was an issue with, uh, with it and they, they lost it. And it, and it just, we lost a very unique service <laughs> and I was so sad <laughs> and I was, I really hated it for all of the, the kids that were not going to be served, um, because of that. Um, and it's just because they had, they kind of had all their eggs in one basket. I mean, they may have, I've had other little things, but it was a large, large percentage just funded that whole program. So exactly like, uh, like you just said, when you're doing your SWAT, you know, looking at all, you know, how many different funding streams are there? If they have one program that 75% of their funding is from one source, you know, that's something that you're going to want to consider. Um, things that have multiple funding streams also might be more um, administratively expensive to run. That's not always true. But um, if you've got, if you're having to track, you know, 17 different grants or something, <laughs> um, you know, that that's going to take a lot of uh, kind of, you know, behind the behind the scenes work to do that, which which may kind of drive up um, some costs as well. Um, OK, so that's kind of it for the the budget piece. Um, are there any questions about about all of that? I know that was kind of a lot in a short period of time, but. I'm hopeful that this kind of helps your understanding is when you're actually looking at the budgets that you get, um, how to kind of, to kind of think through, you know, how to talk about those. Um, okay, I'm just going to run through this really quickly. Um, if you have any, again, if you have any follow-up questions, please, you know, email me, let me know, uh, or jump in now and uh, ask a question. Um, this part is kind of shifting to um, kind of funding and resource procurement. So you know, how are you going to get all this revenue? <laughs> how are you going to get all this money? Um, and really looking at fundraising as is a primary component of the organization's, you know, strategic plan. You have to figure out, you know, where is this revenue going to come from? So we have all these goals. We have all these priorities. Okay, how are we going to fund? Um, kind of typical, typical question that we all face. Um, and just as it's um, never a good idea to rely on one funding source, it's also ideal that you don't rely on one um, fundraising strategy to, uh, you know, to get these other, uh, other 
uh, revenue streams. Um, so typically, when you look at a fundraising plan, which is typically integrated into your larger strategic plan, um, there are uh, ways to analyze uh, the quality of the, that fundraising plan by making to kind of just some 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 checks, some benchmarks here um, to make sure that the um, the strategies are mission congruent. You know, you want all of those um, uh, pieces to flow um, or to, to whatever money you're raising, you want it to support your mission. Um, you want your fundraising activities to be multifaceted, integrated, and connected. So they don't need to be kind of all going in different directions and the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. Uh, you know, you want them to be um, kind of diversified on their own. Um, can anybody think of some examples of um, fundraising activities or fundraising campaigns uh, that you've been a part of in the past or that you know your agency uh, does every year? Some of you may have even participated in supporting some of these. I can. Yeah. Um, in Memphis, St. Jude, I mean, everybody gives money to St. Jude at mm -hmm. some point, but I was just thinking of the race, a lot of places. Yeah. Have races. yeah. I have races, walks, you know, for some reason, it's just like, it's like, you know, gets everybody out. It also has a kind of dual um, purpose of um, raising awareness as well as raising funds. Um, you know, sometimes you might even kind of lose funds doing a big event like that. I mean, hopefully not, but sometimes, you know, they're expensive, especially if you start, you know, bringing bands in and things like that. You have lots of, you know, food vendors, things that cost money. Um, you, um, but it, but organizations may still do it because they, uh, it's part of their mission to raise awareness. So sometimes those, uh, can be a uh, dual purpose. Any other examples that you all can think of? You know, walk, walks are huge. Um, Nashville cares here in Nashville has, uh, it's actually coming up in a couple of weeks has, you know, dining out for life where they have uh, relationships with uh, restaurants that devote a certain percentage, like say 10% of their overall sales for that one night will go to Nashville Cares. Um, that has actually been going on a long time and they have a number of restaurants that par participate that in that and that's kind of a win-win. It sort of uh, gets, gets the word out, it gets you connected with um, other um, people that may not, you know, come to National Care's big, you know, AIDS walk in um, October. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, that's a different thing. Um, a lot of um, organizations will have big um, galas, you know, there's like Jamming to Beat the Blues that's coming up here um, in Nashville. Um, there's a lot of, um, yeah, Turkey Trot. That's a great example. Um, there's, uh, you know, so there's a, there's a number of different things. And so it's just something that, that you want to be um, diversified, you want it to be integrated. Um, and also, it is all about relationships, just like you have, uh, you build rapport and you have relationships with your clients and clinical practice. Um, when you're looking at, you know, fundraising in order to support your agency, you want to build those long term relationships with donors and other funding agencies. So, um, it's really important. It helps with sustainability. It helps with, um, it, it creates less work down the line. Um, if Nashville Cares had to go out every single year and pound the pavement and find those restaurants that they were going to support, you know, and donate their funds, if they had to do that every single year, that would probably be exhausting <laughs> and not really a good use of time. But because they have people that can develop those relationships over time um, and those, you know, restaurants kind of stay on the list, then you kind of ask them, hey, are you up for this again next year? Sure, you know, and, and you can just kind of maintain those long-term relationships. Um, especially with kind of corporate sponsors, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies sponsor a lot of things. Um, you know, the, all those kind of those charitable giving campaigns that the corporations do that are kind of a win for them because they get a tax write-off. You know, those are those um, big relationships that can translate into a lot of dollars that are really uh, important for agencies uh, too. Um, case statements. Um, these are uh, kind of either internal or external 
um, documents that help an organization articulate a clear and compelling reason for why people should make a contribution. So these um, are statements that are really going to kind of give the who, what, when, where, why of uh, why should people should, you know, why are, why are we the best? Why are, you know, do we, you know, how many people do we serve every year and how good are we with our money and why should you trust us? And, um, you know, look at all these needs we're meeting. It's really the kind of rationale document. It's, um, uh, it's also, um, it's just something that can be kind of used sort of once it's written, it's written and it can kind of be, um, used, um, for, uh, you know, grant applications or things like that. Um, you may have even visited a website and the entire first page is essentially their case statement for how great they are and what they do. Um, you might not realize that that's essentially what you're reading, but, um, you know, it's ways to, it's ways to do that. Um, so there's, there's um, multiple uses for that. Um, so there are a lot of different fundraising approaches. Um, won't kind of talk about all of these, but, um, you know, most typically you'll see kind of an annual campaign. Um, uh, these are those kind of pledge drives or things like that, or you might have an annual gala. Um, the capital campaign, that's like, again, it's like if you're, if you want to expand a building or you want to buy a van or do something that costs over $5,000, you may have an entire fundraising campaign just for that one thing. Um, the King's Daughter School Center for Autism did a massive um, capital campaign to um, uh, build a 24-7 uh, uh, residential facility for uh, children uh, with uh, really low functioning autism. And they were able to, you know, I think raise over a million dollars just for that, uh, that one building. So that was a big campaign, you know, just for that. Um, major gifts, these are gifts of a significant amount of size, which can vary uh, may uh, be repeated periodically. Um, there's planned giving programs, um, and this is kind of a set way for donors to kind of leave money. Um, they get to plan for it. Um, the people who are receiving the money get to plan for it. Um, anybody who's ever had a um, know of someone who has um, died and they have said things like, you know, in lieu of flowers, you know, the family is asking that you donate to X, Y, and Z charity. You know, that would be an example of a, of a planned gift. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so I've already kind of talked about this, but there's lots of different kinds of um, corporate contributions. And these are just huge. I can't really um, understate this. <laughs> um, it's, really a, it's really a way for um, corporations to have massive tax write-offs um, to give you know, huge dollars to, you know, offset their profits so that they limit their, their tax liability. And it's a huge opportunity. It's a huge win for nonprofits who are receiving uh, the benefit of all of those dollars. Um, so things like corporate giving funds, there's entire, you know, there's people who is their whole job to work inside a large, you know, fortune 500 company and figure out, you know, how are they going to spend their money? <laughs> you know, what charities are they going to give to? So um, there's lots of different, uh, different uh, opportunities for that. Um, kind of recent phenomenon is um, all of the electronic philanthropy that's happening. Um, GoFundMe campaigns, um, Kickstarter campaigns, you know, we had a whole, um, actually the last few political um, presidential campaigns have been largely and, um, you know, funded by, you know, dollar contributions here, $5 here, $20 here. Um, there's uh, definitely some, some pros and cons to that, depending on your agency. Um, but you might have email requests. It's certainly going to be a lot cheaper than, um, you know, sending out, you um, you know, things in the mail, which uh, definitely costs a lot of money. Um, you know, business ventures, this is something that, um, you know, can be risky because it can kind of cost a lot of money to start up, um, but it can be a huge um, income generator for your nonprofit. Um, can anybody think of any examples? There's definitely a big one here in Nashville, but I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, everywhere else that there's probably examples of this. Can anybody think of one? where you have a nonprofit that starts some kind of a business or um, generate some kind of good to, uh, for people to buy so that the, the money goes back to the charity. Kind of goes, can go in the category of like social enterprises. 
Um, can anybody think of any examples? Catholic Charities has a St. Bernard's program where they make bandanas and bow ties for animals and then the money goes back to the organization. Perfect example, you know, and probably pretty low cost um, and, you know, kind of helps out in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah, that's a great example. Um, the one from Nashville that I was thinking of is um, with, uh, you know, Magdalene House. They have the whole Thistle Farms um, piece that the women who live in uh, the house all uh, participate in. And so they generate, you know, amazing bath and body pro products from, you know, lotions to chapsticks to room sprays to candles, you know, all kinds of stuff um, all under the Thistle Farms um, uh, you know, business. And all of those funds go straight back into um, go straight back into the, um, into Magdalene house. And they actually even now have the Thistle Stop Cafe, where is a, which is a fantastic restaurant on the west side of town in Nashville. If you are in the area, I highly recommend it. And, um, they have, that is a, um, you know, fully functioning restaurant. And the women who, um, participate in Magdalene house also work in the restaurant. And so the restaurant itself, um, uh, and bakery, um, you know, generates funds It's the actual, you know, brick and mortar store or a restaurant. And then also in the restaurant, they sell the Thistle Farms products, um, that you can buy as well. So it's kind of this kind of mul is very multifaceted, um, kind of integrated whole, uh, campaign that they, uh, or, you know, business venture that they do. Um, so a couple things to just, you know, make sure you're questioning as you're kind of out there in the world, you know, you may be asked to participate in fundraising events. It's a very common uh, thing in our line of work. Um, but there's some, a couple questions that you want to make sure that you're asking things like, you know, how does the event fit into the organization's overarching strategic plan? You know, do we have the support to pull it off successfully? You know, do we have the resources that we need to pull it off successfully? Um, you know, what's your margin going to be? Um, what are your goals? Uh, there's a million questions you can ask around this, but one of them also to not forget is, um, is your specific fundraising strategy legal in your state? Um, things as simple as like raffles, you know, where you buy, you know, spend $5, you get a ticket. Um, the ticket goes in the big, you know, big wheel and then, you know, they draw the number. Um, things that, uh, are in that lane that could be sort of considered chance um, of some kind uh, in some states may lean a little bit too uh, much towards gambling and it would be subject to uh, to um, kind of gambling laws so things like that um, you want to make sure that you're you know kind of dotting your eyes and crossing your t's there too um, so, you know, lastly, if you're having a big event, you know, you want to make sure you're asking these questions on the front end, you know, can we do it? Do we have the resources? Um, and typically it just kind of follows a pattern of, you know, generating ideas, deciding if it's feasible, determining your objectives, you want to plan the event, um, you know, then obviously implement and definitely evaluate um, the results. You may find out that it, you know, you really didn't make that much money or it was too time consuming and stressful for the, the staff and they had to be pulled off of their normal jobs. And so then those kind of waned and they weren't giving, you know, good services to clients because they were planning this event. You know, there's a number of different ways to evaluate um, the results, but it's definitely, you know, make sure you have this continuous qu uh, quality improvement, you know, kind of CQI uh, feedback loop to make sure that um, you're really actually thinking critically about, you know, how successful it was. So um, I think that's, uh, that's it pretty much for um, conversations around, uh, procurement and finances and um, we've got just a few minutes left but I uh, would like to know if uh, you all have any any last questions um, about any of that or again any just general questions about your about the course or anything else maybe coming up everybody knows when they're presenting or submitting their uh, their recorded sessions. Um, um, okay. 
So if there's no questions, we will go ahead and um, wrap it up. I have absolutely loved um, having you all in class. I loved reading your leadership self-assessment papers. I'm very excited about everything that you all are going to bring to the field. And I'm uh, really looking forward to reading your um, SWOT narratives and um, participating in your presentations and um, uh, just love teaching this class and, uh, and hope that you've gotten a lot out of it. And if you have recommendations for improvement, um, definitely would love for you to um, email me or absolutely fill out your uh, course evaluation and, um, uh, and let me know how it was. All right. Well, I hope you all have a great uh, evening and I uh, will talk to you later. Thank you.